a comprehensive kind of, it said review like a certain part, blah, 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 but you don't have to do that at all. Um, that was for a different, I just have updated the review in a couple of semesters. All right, um, any specific questions before we just kind of walk through them like we do? Tubules themselves and um, 
Uh, so that's very common. Then you have the simple squamous, which we see um, in the descending limb of the loop of Henle, and we also see simple squamous in the parietal layer of our Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule. Um, and then transitional epithelium, you see that one in uh, the ureter and the urethra and in the bladder, um, you see transitional epithelium. Um, podocytes are just special cells that make up the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule uh, that cling to the surface of the glomerulus and help to form our filtration membrane. I mean, when I do this, I look for words that are associated together and go, this is just one that apparently there's not people to do it. Um, anyway, so the podocytes have little foot processes on them. So little, it makes it kind of like an intermeshing of fingers coming together like that to creates our filtration slit where the filtration membrane would be. Uh, the parietal layer, of course, is the simple squamous epithelium. So we would find parietal layer and visceral layer making up the Bowman's capsule, which looks like a glove that fits around the glomerulus. Um, the renal tubule system consists of proximal convoluted tubule, which is closest, comes right off the Bowman's capsule. Then we have the loop of Henle, which has a descending limb and an ascending limb. And then we have the distal convoluted tubules. Um, and then we dump into the collecting ducts. So, uh, renal tubules consist of bonus capsule, proximal convoluted tubules, and distal convoluted tubules. All right. Um, and then we'll probably have some questions that talk about what happens in some of these different areas. ADH is just basic uh, antidiuretic hormone, which targets the kidneys to reabsorb water. Uh, renin, we know, is released by special cells in the kidneys. And renin uh, causes a conversion of angiotensin to angiotensin II, which is going to be a, a vasoconstrictor to try to help raise blood pressure and, and, uh, to the kidney. Um, aldosterone is a hormone coming from the adrenal gland that um, targets the kidneys to retain salt or sodium specifically and also has a couple of other secondary effects like help stimulate the thirst reflex and um, as well. Uh, but causes a decrease in urine output because you're retaining sodium and water follows that so they decrease um, um, urine output that way. Uh, filtrate is just what we need raw urine, another way for referring to raw urine uh, before we have reabsorbed everything. Uh, there is a glomerular filtration rate, which is about 125 mils per minute is our basic rate, which we have the ability to auto-regulate up and down depending upon uh, the water volume basically in the body, right? And the cells that are kind of responsible for kind of helping to monitor this and help with, ad with ad adjusting this are the macula densa cells, which are found in the wall of the distal convoluted tubule in a association called the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which is an association of the distal convoluted tubule, the afferent arterial, and um, um, that all kind of come all up together right around the uh, uh, Bowman's capsule. You have that kind of um, apparatus, so juxtaglomerular apparatus. Okay, gosh. Um, JG cells are cells found also as part of the juxtaglomerular glomerular apparatus. These are the ones that are found in our um, afferent arterial wall, and these are the ones that secrete the rent. So they're monitoring and responding to blood pressure, where the macula densa cells are responding to concentration of the urine. Ah, retroperitoneal is just referring to the fact that the kidneys are found back behind the peritoneal uh, serous membrane system, so they're not enclosed in a, in a, uh, with a serosa. Uh, filtration membrane consists of three things, uh, a glomerular caps, uh, we'd say a capillary endothelium, which is from the glomerulus, a layer of glue, the basal lamina, and uh, the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule, which is composed of the podocytes. So those things all come together to form our filtration membrane. Uh, basolateral membrane has to do with 
the reabsorption of material in the proximal convoluted tubules or in the tubular system. So that doesn't have anything to do with our filtration membrane up here. So we've kind of switched gears here and we're looking at um, um, just basic the process of what is tubular reabsorption. So tubular reabsorption is what it says. We're reabsorbing the majority of the raw filtrate that we're producing. We reabsorb it. And we can say that most of it is going to be reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. And then as it moves through the loop of Henle, we're going to absorb different things. And then also with the distal convoluted tubule. But we would say, I would think at least of 70% is probably reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. So we're pulling it out. And so where does the substance go? It comes from the renal tubule and moves across into the paratubular capillaries, across into the paratubular capillaries. All right, uh, tubular secretion just means exactly what it says. We're going to secrete products or substances into uh, the renal tubules for, so that they can basically be dumped into the urine. And we do this in the proximal convoluted tubule, but we do it an awful lot in the distal convoluted tubule and somewhat in the collecting ducts as well. But I tend to focus on distal convoluted tubule as my main site for tubular secretion. And the products that get secreted would be things like very small molecules that were um, inadvertently uh, pulled along with water reabsorption like urea and uric acid and then also metabolic byproducts of different types of chemicals like medications and things like that are two really good examples of things that are secreted. Alright, so transport maximum is talking about when we get to our um, uh, process of reabsorption, we have a membrane, membranes that basically that substance has to get across. We have a luminal uh, membrane or, or luminal barrier, the basolateral barrier, barrier, and then we have the capillary endothelial layer. So there's three of them. And uh, one of the things we talked about was that while we have um, unlimited um, transport for sodium to come across, that the other molecules like small amino acids or glucose or various things like that have to kind of catch a ride and there exists something called a transport maximum for those substances and so once that max maximum has been reached then uh, those substances uh, are no longer reabsorbed and they spill out into the urine and so we detect them and glucose is a really good example of that. Um, okay, where are we at? Urethra, of course, is just the tube that drains the bladder. Um, when you look at the bladder, we know that it has transitional epithelium and that the inner lining of the bladder is called a rugosa. Um, there is an area of the uh, in the bladder where urine pools, which is called the trigone. Um, the muscle that controls uh, the process of voiding or micturation is the detrusor of muscle. Um, the pigment that contributes to the yellow color with urine is called urochrome. And then we have two sphincters that we have that we use to control the release of urine from the bladder. The internal urethral sphincter and the external urethral sphincter. And the external is the one that you voluntarily control. Alright, then um, with the female urethra, it's really quite short, and so it's just plain, the plain urethra. In uh, males, uh, it has to travel through the penis, and so you have uh, different regions, and so you have a spongy urethra, there's an intermediate urethra, there's a prosthetic urethra as it passes through the different organs. Okay, uh, urea is just a protein metabolic byproduct. It's very small. It's one of the substances that is uh, secreted into the urine. A renal calci is a kidney stone, which is formed of a variety of different substances. Uh, basically, it forms a crystal um, that, uh, and we talk about uh, how kidney stone attacks and trying to pass them and uh, different things like that. Um, let's see. 
Then you've got um, your blood supply that you're going to definitely be asked uh, to identify whatever the next step would be in our blood supply. So you see renal artery, segmental interlober. Um, um, then you've got the arcuate radial corticoid artery. Then you go to the afferent arterial, the glomerulus efferent arterial carotid capillary. Then you go back to radial cortical vein, arcuate vein, interlobar vein, renal vein. So make sure you've got your pathway. Um, in incontinence, we really didn't talk about it very much, hardly, but most everybody is familiar with, with what incontinence is. And of course, it's the inability to control um, uh, <coughs> maturation or voiding. And um, it has to do with a weakening many times of that external uh, urethral sphincter, or it sometimes can be due to pressure, uh, sudden pressure changes in the abdominal pelvic cavity, like laughing or pregnancy, things like that. Um, micturation, again, is just voiding. <clears throat> we tend, and we can really talk about this too much. Usually, for about every, I think about 200 mils or so, 150 to 200 mils of urine in the bladder, then you get, you start sending signals to the brain because as the bladder's stretching, you start getting signals of, oh, I need to go to the bathroom, which then, of course, you can override. And you can override that until the, the bladder's really quite full, close to a liter or so. Uh, so we can hold a considerable amount. Can, can the bladder rupture? Yeah, it absolutely can rupture. Uh, it's one of the things that, just in a side note, like with surgeries and different things at hospitals, um, after they do anesthesia, one of the big key things is they, they like to keep you in the hospital until you can void. So make sure that you're not going to have a problem with that. Otherwise, if they send you home before you can do that, and for whatever reason you're unable to void, then the bladders continue to fill and fill and fill, and it can cause a lot of pain. And you have to go in and bas they'll cap you, basically pull that urine off and try to figure out what, why are you not able to, to void. Sometimes it just takes a little bit longer, um, but um, it's, you know, one of those complications that they uh, see quite often with anesthesia. Okay. Solvent drag, we've identified already. I don't know why oh, oh, genesis and spermatogenesis are there. We'll come back to that later. Collecting tubules, we know, receives the urine. Um, after it's gone through the distal convoluted tubules, they all go into the collecting tubules. And we do have some secretion and a little bit of reabsorption of water that can happen there, but not a whole lot. Uh, pyelitis, pyelonephritis, and cystitis. So pyelitis is a infection or inflammation in the renal pelvis. Pyelonephritis is the pelvis and the actual kidney itself, like the renal pyramid, et cetera. So that would be way worse. And then a UTI is also called cystitis, and so that means that the infection is in the bladder and not up into the kidney. So it's just identifying the correct term for whatever that condition might be. All right, let's see what we have. What is the volume of raw filtrate produced each day by the kidneys? About 180 liters. What is the volume actually excreted? About 1.5 to 1.8, somewhere in there, uh, liters of uh, finished urine. How many nephrons are found within the kidney? Oh, at least a million. Uh, what is the difference between the glomerulus and irregular capillary? So we already talked about that. We have three big characteristics besides the structure of the vessel, the arterial at the beginning and at the end, and the high pressure. So you've got three, about three characteristics there. What are the functions of the urinary system? Oh, well, produce urine, regulation of blood pressure, regulation of the erythrocyte production rate as well. Those are kind of our three big ones. Because you have the renin, which adjusts blood pressure. And then you have erythropoietin, which sets our red blood cell production rate, which comes from the kidneys as well. We talked about functions of real fascia and real adipose. Where are the kidneys located in the within the body? Well, retroperitoneal and in the lumbar region. You could add that other condition, ptosis, P 
PTOFIF for when the kidneys fall out of the lumbar area. Um, how are the kidneys, how can the kidneys regulate the glomerular filtration rate? Well, they basically do so by vasoconstriction and vasodilation of that, uh, the arterioles to either slow the, slow, slow the filtrate production down or speed it up. So we're changing a pressure. We're actually regulating the pressure as it pushes through the glomerular. What happens when ADH is inactivated? Um, you would not restore, reabsorb the water in the distal convoluted tubules or from the collecting ducts, and so you would produce a very dilute um, and um, larger volume of urine. How is the raw filtrate different from plasma? Well, no red blood cells or white blood cells, and there should not be any proteins particularly in uh, raw filtrate as well, so no filtrate. Um, that's about it. How does the proximal convoluted tubules differ from the distal convoluted tubules? Um, for us, we're kind of saying that the proximal convoluted tubules, uh, really structurally, they have a lot more microvilli when compared to the distal. So structurally, that's what you're looking at. Um, where does the majority of the raw filtrate, we, oh, um, that's in the proximal convoluted tubule, is where the majority of it's reabsorbed. And the loop of Henle, which limb is permeable to water? Uh, it would be our, um, our descending limb coming down is permeable to water, so we concentrate the urine there. And then uh, as we come up, the ascending one uh, is no longer permeable to water, it's only permeable to salt. So there we pull that out, which makes it more dilute. Where do, and we already did that. We already did that. And then omit this. I meant there was a review question. Any questions just about the kidneys? So uh, we'd be doing good to get 50 questions probably off of that. Um, and then hopefully be able to add in some more here to, so that we can um, get as close to about 75 questions as the filler is always my goal just so they don't count for so much. Um, okay, you, you want to uh, be able to recognize, um, we can do this two ways. I can give you numbers and say, is this acidosis or alkalosis? Uh, is it metabolic or respiratory? Or I, I, what I do sometimes is I'll say that this is a cause of metabolic acidosis or metabolic acidosis is commonly associated with this particular type of disorder. So you can get it two, two ways. Most students do better if I just tell you a disorder and, and tell you which one it's associated. Like metabolic acidosis, you could go with um, alcohol, uh, because we're getting acetic acid, exercise, or you could do ketoacidosis with diabetes. Uh, where metabolic alkalosis, you're looking at antacids that, and diarrhea, constipation, vomiting. Respiratory acidosis, you're looking at a problem with the respiratory membrane itself, like pneumonia. And respiratory alkalosis, you'd be looking at something like hyperventilation, not normally associated with a disease process. All right, then you've got um, here, of course, two muscles, the dartus and the cremaster. So dartus, and I may have said this backwards the other day, crinkles wrinkles the scrotum and the cremaster raises it up uh, next to the body to adjust for temperature is the main, main purpose here uh, because they need the temperature to be a couple of degrees lower than the general body temperature. Uh, seminiferous tubules of course are the area where we find uh, spermatogenesis occurring inside the testes. The blood testis barrier, of course, is just a separation that we have uh, created in the with the capillaries, blood capillaries, with lots of tight junctions to prevent the uh, male's immune system from getting access or exposure to the developing uh, spermatids, since they would be essentially non-self. So 
seminal vesicles and pro, uh, the, prostat the prostate gland or prostatic fluids are both just fluids. You won't have to distinguish which one does what, which one has the sugar, which ones. Uh, they both just contribute to uh, the production of the semen. Um, I, cause we did not go into that as much as we do sometimes in some classes. Bobo, your urethral fluid, you do need to know that that really is not contributing so much to the semen as it's um, neutralizing and clearing the way, because it's going mainly more mucus, to clear the way uh, of the urethra before the uh, sperm uh, moves through there. Spermatogenesis <coughs> is the production of sperm, and uh, where we are cutting the chromosome number <coughs> one and half and shuffling the, the chromosomes up so that they are uniquely different, and uh, it occurs um, once a male reaches puberty, it's a continual process. It does diminish with age, but still we're, we're producing, um, uh, they're producing lots of sperm. And you could ask a question like, if you went with the original stem cell and spermatogenesis, uh, we, how many functional spermatids do you get? You get four, so as a result of that process. Um, Follicle stimulating hormones in general, in the most generic kind of term, we would say they stimulate the production and maturing of uh, uh, the egg and stimulate the production and maturing of the sperm, where luteinizing hormones are the ones responsible for uh, stimulating the production of the hormones, such as testosterone in males, which then uh, ties with our um, um, anyway, so uh, where was I going? Anyway, so male hormone, of course, is testosterone. There's the androgen binding protein that comes from the from the uh, where's it coming from? That's stimulated from the follicle stimulating hormone targeting the testes to produce that in the seminiferous tubule. Uh, actually, it's doing our interstitial cells. And where's our? I don't have the other one in there, so I have to worry about it. Um, anyway, so we'll just keep it generic. Follicle is going to be the maturing of the sperm and maturing of the egg and luteinizing will be the hormone. Um, oogenesis, production of the egg, it's lopsided, kind of knowing that. Uh, we get one functional egg and the rest are polar bodies so that we have an uneven uh, division. Um, there it begins and the process before birth and then it has several stages that it uh, basically is in kind of frozen ant stasis as it were. Uh, once a female then begins ovulating um, then you have your original primordial follicles that have been basically frozen in stasis will begin to develop as prim primary follicles then secondary follicles Secondary follicles always have the formation of um, spaces, and a big space would be an anthrum. A mature follicle for a female then is the graphene follicle. And once a, you have ovulation, the remaining, the remnants of that follicle still in the ovary form the corpus luteum that produces progesterone, which basically sets the stage for our uh, implantation. And then estrogen is our hormone that's being released uh, from the ovaries under the direct, being stimulated by luteinizing hormone. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what we got. Any questions? Good Lord. Let's see what we got. We may already answer them. Function of the scrotum. Oh. Okay. Adjust temperature so that we have an appropriate temperature for spermatogenesis. That's the function of the scrotum, is basically to adjust so that um, they don't, it doesn't get too hot or too cold. Uh, what does the peak of testosterone do during fetal development? Uh, determination, oh, we did not do that. But that basically is what stimulates whether it's going to be a male or a female. It's sex, uh, sex oriented, but yeah, we did not do that, so we'll omit to. Uh, what sir, we did not do that either, so we'll not worry about that. So we just totally omitted the poor male. Um, what hormones do you need to trigger ovulation? So follicle and luteinizing both peak. And estrogen has been slowly increasing, but it's really a surge of follicle and um, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Um, 
you can omit five, so we'll do fair, fair, fair for omitting things on the guy, and we'll omit stuff on the girl too. Um, when do you see an increase in production of progesterone? So we know that's coming from the corpus luteum, so we already answered that for implantation. And you can skip number seven because we mentioned it very briefly, but we really didn't talk about it as much as sometimes we do. And we've already just answered that. Without implantation, what structure produces progesterone, the corpus luteum? So that's kind of it. So we're omitting a few things. So most of this will be a little bit of structure and a little bit of a hormones. I don't know if I can come up with 25 questions on all six. So that's pretty skimpy to kind of ask. But questions? All right, I think I have case studies. I think the grades are out there. I think I have everything done. The only thing I might be missing on a few people is um, peer review. So after today, if you don't if you don't fill out a peer review after today, your case study points will be blocked. So I will subtract points off if you don't do the period. Um, and I think I think that's it. There's a course my homework is due today, right? And even though I and with it with the lab one, I still haven't made adjustments on that. There was something about two questions. So I know to do it. I just run out of time. <laughs>